Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Today we're going to discuss uh, amplifier classes. This is a pretty advanced topic for can you compare to most of the other stuff I've talked about. And so if not everything makes sense right away, so you can always do more research, Google it, uh, look for some of the key phrases that I'm talking about, or uh, if you're really stuck, you're always welcome to uh, throw a comment or question down below. To kind of set the stage for our discussion, an amplifier is uh, some sort of device uh, that takes a smaller signal and makes it larger. That's really all an amplifier is. And uh, over the years, the most common uh, forms of amplifiers, specifically the output stage, because an amplifier can actually grow you know, almost infinitely complex if you really want it to. But specifically the output stage, the stage that's directly sending something out uh, has been classified into uh, their letter forms. There's A, B, AB, uh, C, and D are really the, re uh, the really common ones. And there's actually a whole bunch of other letters that you know, are used, etc. But we're not going to talk about, we're going to talk about the, those five that I mentioned. When learning about the different classes of amplifiers, I always felt like, particularly in school, uh, a lot of stuff was omitted. And so I'm going to try and fill in some of the missing pieces, but just be aware that I'm not filling in 100% of the picture because amplified, you know, you could do individual videos on the different amplifier stages. You can actually do multiple videos on each amplifier uh, class. Uh, to really get down into the nitty gritty portions, what, I'm, uh, what my plan is is to fill in some of the missing pieces that may kind of bring the picture into more focus versus just kind of the general overview that particularly textbooks and you know some online videos of will uh, do. Whenever you see a representation of a typical class A, this is a class A amplifier stage, uh, this is what you see. Have a resistor and a transistor working together, but I've always felt like some of the pieces of this class A amplifier are missing. And depending on what tutorial you look at, sometimes those pieces are filled in more than others, but let's uh, piece them together. The first thing to note is that, oh, uh, what we're going to be talking about is more so related to audio amplifiers. And so some of the stuff we're gonna fill in is audio amplifier related. So the first thing is you have your rails. All amplifiers have rails. Those are the rails that the amplifier works from to produce the output signal. And in this case, uh, for simplicity, we're going to make the top rail plus uh, 16 volts and the bottom rail here minus 16 volts. Uh, the reason why I use 16 volts will make sense a little bit later. But the thing specifically to understand is that an amplifier, specifically an audio one, tends to work off of a positive and negative voltage. And there is a ground in the system somewhere that these two voltages are referenced to. The next thing to fill in in the circuit is the transistor bias. What is the transistor bias? The transistor bias is the part of the circuit that turns the transistor on just the right amount. What does that mean? Well, if we take the output here and actually draw an element in that represents the output and we could, uh, a real common way of doing it is to draw a speaker and just kind of go boop and then this portion goes to ground and remember ground is the part between exactly between the top rail and the bottom rail here right here in the middle and you could actually if you really wanted to represent the load element as just a resistor because it's very easy to think of it that way but anyway uh, the res uh, the transistor bias uh, is what turns the transistor on just the correct amount 
so that when the circuit is uh, at rest, whenever it's not doing anything, the output of the amplifier exactly equals ground. And so if we want to throw some values in, let's suppose this resistor is 8 ohms. the transistor bias uh, will turn the transistor on just the correct amount so that the voltage drop or the current through the transistor is exactly equivalent to 8 ohms and a, vol a, you know, a voltage divider type scheme tells us that uh, if you have 8 ohms on top and 8 ohms on the bottom the point in the, between the two is exactly the middle so if you have 16 uh, volts up here and minus 16 volts down here, you would get effectively ground equivalent here in the middle. The way this bias, one way to do this bias, let me delete this, is to, you know, kind of tack off the upper rail and then just throw in a resistor. This works as a bias, but it's not the best bias uh, for reasons that I don't feel we should get in here. The better bias then has another resistor here, which ties into the negative rail. <coughs> and depending on how you want to set this up, you know, you could make, let's say this resistor adjustable. There's a bunch of different ways you could do the biasing. And so you could, uh, you know, using a potentiometer, for example, adjust <coughs> the bias point here so that the output here is, you know, when everything else is at rest, is exactly zero volts or ground. And then to kind of bring everything together, you then take the input here and put it through a coupling capacitor. <coughs> And the input is then also a reference to ground. The reason for this uh, coupling capacitor or a DC blocking capacitor, either phrase more or less works, is that uh, the uh, bias here for the transistor could negatively affect the circuits upstream. And if we're talking about audio, audio is always AC, there's no such thing as DC audio. And so by choosing the value of this capacitor correctly, audio will just pass through that capacitor uh, unimpeded effectively, uh, but the DC can't pass through the circuit back this way. So now we can get into the real nitty gritty of how a class A amplifier works. And we've already talked about that when the input signal is zero, when there's no input signal, the transistor is on just the correct amount so that it balances out the uh, load here, the uh, uh, resistor on top. And that forms effectively a resistive divider. And that means that the output here to our load or speaker, whatever you want to uh, call it, is exactly zero. So now let's say at the input, we go from a zero to a positive going sine wave like that compared to ground. What does that do? Well, the positive going sine wave over here causes the transistor here to uh, further turn on. When the transistor further turns on, the transistor will actually take this point, you know, as the transistor turns on, the uh, resistive portion of it gets smaller as it turns on and so this point right here will actually get dragged further down closer to uh, the minus 16 volts and so the uh, waveform that represents uh, the output here as compared to the input will look something like this and i've tried to draw it larger than this one but it, you know it's kind of difficult in that respect and so the, uh, if we look over here, uh, now we move on to the other portion of the waveform, which would be an, a negative going sine wave like that. And the opposite happens in the negative going portion of the sine wave. The negative portion will cause the transistor to turn off more 
which uh, makes the resistance here larger, which then takes this point and drags it further up to the positive 16. And so what you get is the positive going portion of the waveform, like that. Some things to note from what we've just looked at. The first is that if you haven't noticed already, this kind of amplifier is inverting, meaning that when the waveform here is positive, the waveform over here is negative and vice versa. For the case of audio, it doesn't particularly matter as long as if all of the uh, output stages are inverting, well then, there's not an issue. If all of the output stages are non-inverting, there's not an issue. Where you run into problems is if you inadvertently mix and match your output stages, if you have one speaker that's being driven by an inverted uh, signal and another speaker that's being driven by a non-inverted signal and the two speakers uh, side by side will just sound wrong. You won't be able to quite tell you know, what it is, but just wrong. And uh, sometimes you can't fix this by just reversing the connection on the speaker to drive it in the other direction to kind of re-invert the signal back to where it needs to go. But just be aware that it's generally not a good idea to mix, you know, if you have multiple things driving speakers to mix and match inverted and non-inverted, it can just sound weird. So what are the advantages of a class A amplifier? Well, the first, and I don't know if you you not seeing some of the other stages we're about to look at, uh, the class A amplifier stage is incredibly simple. We have one active element and we have effectively with four passive elements, including the biasing. But uh, if you really boil it down to the bare essentials is you have your uh, the load element and you have your active element and that's it. There's no other pieces. Uh, class A amplifiers are very easy to set up. The other thing, and this will become more apparent when we start looking at the class B amplifier, is that class A amplifiers don't have something called crossover distortion. What that means is when you look at <coughs> uh, the spots here, here, and here, and same with the output waveform here, here, and here, <coughs> Uh, these spots are, uh, the output is perfectly reproduces uh, the input. That uh, uh, the spots where you cross zero, that's what's referred to as the crossover. Like here, if you kind of imagine this being the zero line, <clears throat> uh, there's no distortion to them at all or whatsoever. Class A amplifiers have been around for a very long time. Um, radios from uh, back when radio was first invented, you know, when the thing uses tubes or valves, whatever you want to call them, uh, used class A amplifiers just due to the simplicity. If you can imagine replacing this transistor with a valve, and you'll also need an output transformer here because valves work at very high voltages, but very low currents. But speakers tend to work at very uh, low voltages, but high currents. And so you need a transformer in between your output stage and the speaker to <clears throat> uh, uh, make sure that the impedances match and the speaker is driven properly. But so you can imagine this uh, stage with a valve here instead of a transistor, which also uh, is oftentimes where uh, 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 the love for uh, tube-based amplifiers comes from is from stuff like this because, as I mentioned, it's it's very low distortion. <clears throat> it's very simple. It's very cheap to make. What are the disadvantages of a Class A amplifier? And there are lots of them. The absolute biggest tends to be the efficiency of a Class A amplifier. Class A amplifiers are not efficient at all. At the absolute very best, a class A amplifier is 50% efficient. That means that 50% of the power, the total power consumed by the amplifier actually goes out to your speaker. The other 50% is dissipated as heat inside the amplifier. And we can actually, uh, 
you know, just do some very quick math to uh, show that. The reason why I used 8 ohms here is 8 ohms tends to be a pretty common <clears throat> uh, impedance for uh, a speaker. And in this case, we're using resistors just to kind of simplify it to, you know, we're leaving out the reactive element. So if we assume that the speaker is uh, an also an 8 ohm speaker, here, imagine that the uh, waveform went pretty much as negative as you can get it. When the waveform goes completely negative, uh, the uh, transistor here shuts off completely. And all of the current is supplied by the the element, you know, the eight ohm element here. And so 16 volts now will pass through this eight ohms and this eight ohms. And now you can probably tell why I used uh, 16 volts because it makes the uh, math nice in that at 16 volts, there is one amp of current that's passing through both of these elements here. <clears throat> and uh, again, uh, Ohm's law and whatnot tells us that at uh, 8 ohms, you're dropping 8 volts here and you're dropping 8 volts here. And because there's one amp of current passing through both uh, transistors, you're dissipating 8 watts of power here and 8 watts of power here. And like we said, 50% efficient. So out of the 16 watts of power that the amplifier is consuming, only 8, only 50% is making it out to the speaker and 8 is being dissipated inside uh, the load element. <clears throat> and you can also look at it in the other direction that when the waveform is fully positive, uh, the transistor is on and Assuming everything has been set up correctly, the transistor will be dissipating uh, 8 volts uh, and oh, 8 watts and the speaker would be dissipating 8 watts. And if you're keen, you might want you be trying to yell at the TV, well why don't why don't we turn the transistor on more so it dissipates less <clears throat> uh, power here versus what is going out to the the speaker and the reason for that is we want to make sure that the uh, behavior of the transistor matches the behavior of the load element as closely as possible because uh, that would induce non-linearity into the amplifier and so when uh, you know in a non-linear type amplifier when the waveform goes negative you know, it could look like this but when the waveform goes positive it looks like that and it would cause distortion uh, beyond the very poor efficiency, uh, another drawback of the Class A amplifier is that your amplification entirely depends on uh, the <clears throat> uh, beta of the transistor here and the selection of the component. Because, you know, let's say the component you choose here has some nonlinear properties, uh, you'll get distortion. Uh, the you know, let's say you want to make five of the same kind of amplifiers, well, getting five of the same uh, uh, transistor with exactly the same beta are, you know, you're probably going to have to look at bend parts or that kind of thing. <clears throat> and so, so for, uh, you can improve some of those characteristics by, let's say, putting in negative feedback, you know, that's probably a topic for another day. But, you know, this generally puts together the picture of what a Class A amplifier looks like. This is what a Class B amplifier looks like. And I've deliberately not drawn the arrows on the transistors. We'll talk about that in just a second. But some of the same kind of elements that you would expect to find in the Class A amplifier are here. You have two elements, an upper and a lower. Uh, they work in conjunction. You have your output to a load you know, resistor and a speaker, and you have an input. The reason why I haven't drawn the arrows, and uh, this is because I've actually made this mistake, you know, breadboarding circuits, etc., is that which is the NPN and which is the PNP, and this is, this tends to be confusing. 
Basically, there's two ways to draw the arrows, and one way will cause the circuit to explode, and the other way won't. And first, uh, let's look at the exploding circuit. Uh, if you draw the uh, PNP up here, and the MPN down here, like that, uh, I drew them kind of off to the side so it'll be easier to erase. What happens is that the uh, uh, PNP up here will feed through the base of this jumper here, come back this way, feed through uh, the base over here, and then out this way. And just by powering the circuit up, the circuit will explode because both transistors will turn on at the same time when you get an effect called shoot through, meaning that the positive rail connects directly to the negative rail. You turn these into light bulbs and they go poof and explode. The correct way to draw the circuit is this way, that the NPN is on top here and the PNP is on the bottom here. When the circuit is drawn, well, assembled this way, the NPN needs a positive voltage here to turn on, and the uh, PNP needs a negative voltage here to turn on, and so the two can't provide voltages for each other, and the two will stay off. So it's a trap for uh, young players is that how you draw these arrows, how you assemble the circuit. So the NPN is on top and the uh, PNP here is on the bottom. And so again here, let's do the same analysis as we did before, where we compare an input waveform to an output waveform and see what it looks like. So when uh, the circuit is at rest, when there's zero volts here, both transistors are off. And when both transistors are off, the point here is effectively grounded. And so at the beginning, if we have our waveform like this, you know, nothing's happening on the input and nothing is happening on the output. Now the input waveform will go positive, like that. <clears throat> when the input waveform goes positive, uh, the uh, upper transistor here, the NPN turns on, but there's a catch. And that catch is the junction here uh, from the base to, I always forget if that's emitter or collector. Maybe I should look it up before I put my foot in my mouth. But anyway, the junction here uh, sort of represents a diode. And a diode tends to have a turn on voltage of like 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts. Well, that means that the input here has to exceed the 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts before this junction turns on, turning on the transistor. And so what you get is what we talked about with, that the class A amplifier lacks is crossover distortion. And it sort of looks like uh, the waveform, it just kind of jumps up all of a sudden. That as soon as the element turns on and the then you complete the waveform on the other side, and back over here, it sort of jumps down again. <clears throat> and then over here, let's continue our negative going waveform, like that. And again, as you cross through the middle, you get the same effect, but up here, it, it's not quite as obvious. Uh, when you go from a positive going to a negative going waveform, it becomes a little more po uh, obvious because what you get is kind of a gap in between. That gap would theoretically be where the waveform goes like this. I don't know if you can actually see those lines on camera. But uh, this gap is where the sine wave would continue. But instead you get this gap and you get the you kind of a straight shot, the negative going portion of the waveform like that. <clears throat> and that kind of behavior continues. This section right here is called crossover distortion. Uh, this is, that crossover distortion is basically the major weakness of the class B amplifier. 
A Class B amplifier uh, does have very nice advantage compared to the Class A amplifier, and that is that this amplifier is substantially more efficient. Depending on what you read and where, the sample fire efficiency is somewhere between 70 and 80 percent. The reason being is when the uh, input is at zero, uh, the quiescent point is sometimes referred to, uh, both transistors are completely turned off and this amplifier wastes no power uh, you know, just sitting here idling. Whereas compared to a Class A amplifier, just turning it on and not outputting anything at all causes the amplifier to waste a lot of power. Now a class AB <clears throat> amplifier uh, tries to uh, merge the best of both worlds between a class A and a class B. The way it does this, and I wanted to actually draw it out so you can kind of tell exactly uh, the changes that are made, is that if you haven't noticed, the class B amplifier has no biasing. And let me go ahead and get rid of the input and output waveforms, and we're going to add some biasing into the circuit. The way, a classic way to bias a AB <clears throat> a, amplifier is using diodes. And the way that looks like is you have, you tap off your uh, positive rail, you throw in a resistor like that, and then you throw in a pair of diodes. like so, another resistor, and then you tie it back into your negative rail. And the bases of the transistors here tie into the spots here and here above and below the diodes. And then the center point here goes to, you know, the, let's throw in a coupling capacitor just for good measure, and then your input, like that. <clears throat> What does that accomplish? Well, if you remember, I mentioned earlier that the junction here in the uh, transistor is roughly equivalent to a diode. And so what you're looking at is that 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volt drop. By uh, biasing the, uh, uh, by biasing the circuit in this way, you automatically include two diode drops worth between this base and this base. And so the easiest way to think about it is that when the input here is held at uh, zero and the circuit is sitting at equilibrium, this point here is also zero. So again, assuming that the diodes are equally matched and the resistors are the same, yada, yada, yada. But what that effectively guarantees is that uh, this point here where the base connects is roughly one diode dro drop above zero. Being one diode drop above zero uh, nearly perfectly matches this transistor, you know, assuming that this is the zero point, uh, where the base is one diode drop above the output here. And what that biasing does is it just gently turns the transistor on. And there's actually some other stuff you can play with <coughs> to uh, improve this, but this is kind of the uh, basic setup here. Uh, it tends to be that these transistors are substantially larger, and when you're driving them, etc., they get a little warmer than the diodes down here. And uh, what you get is that the diode drop here is just a tiny bit less than the diode drop across here because the resistors at the top and bottom here tend to be of you know one to uh, one k to several k variety. And so what happens is that these two transistors are on just the tiniest amount. And so you eliminate the crossover distortion that you saw before, where uh, the input and the output are going to resemble uh, each other just like the class uh, B amplifier, where you get the a waveform like that on the input, but on the output what you get is a waveform that looks like this. <coughs> Notice how I didn't draw any crossover distortion here, here, or here. 
And again, that's because these two transistors are biased on, you basically push them just on the other side of uh, where the crossover distortion would be, <clears throat> and that effectively eliminates the crossover distortion. You might ask yourself, well, why not just go to a straight uh, class B, I'm sorry, to class AB amplifier instead of a class B? This is because, you know, as you can see, the disadvantage of the class uh, AB amplifiers, it's more complicated. You have more elements here to deal with. Uh, other things to consider is that the, and I forgot to mention this actually for the class B amplifiers, that your transistors need to be uh, closely matched to uh, be able to get a, a non-nice, uh, nice non-distorted signal. And, uh, to, NPM and PNP transistors tend to be kind of difficult to match in the sense of the uh, PNP tends to perform worse than your NPM counterpart, and so you kind of have to, you know, balance the two out. Often, uh, manufacturers will make transistors in uh, matched pairs, etc. Uh, also, the diodes here need to be matched that you don't want one diode to have more of a drop than another diode and also uh, for the circuit to function properly uh, the diodes here could really use being thermally matched to the transistors because what you can get is a runaway effect that if the transistors here get really really hot uh, the uh, forward uh, bias of the junction here could drop so low that the transistors go into kind of a shoot through effect. Uh, the other disadvantage to uh, a class AB amplifier is that it's a lot less efficient than your class B counterpart because uh, at rest, uh, you know, the quiescent consumption of the amplifier is higher than what the class B is because with class B, both transistor elements are off and so the thing doesn't consume any power. In the class AB, because of the biasing, both transistor elements are slightly on, and so uh, they will consume some power. But still, the class AB uh, is uh, uh, more efficient than a, a straight class A. So this is kind of in the 60s to 70% efficient, but again, it depends on how everything's designed and how you do the math so on and so forth. This here is a class C amplifier. I'm only mentioning the class C amplifier for completeness to go from A to D because uh, a class C amplifier is completely worthless for audio. This amplifier is meant to do other things. The reason being is that this load element here consists of an inductor and a capacitor. Uh, this is often referred to as a tank circuit. Uh, what this inductor capacitor does is when you hit it with a pulse, it will resonate at a given frequency. And there's actually a formula for what frequency the inductor and capacitor will resonate at. Uh, theoretically, if the inductor and capacitor were ideal, meaning that they only had inductance and capacitance and no resistance, once you hit the tank circuit with the pulse, it would sit there and it would resonate effectively forever. But because there's no such thing as ideal elements, the capacitor has some resistance and the inductor has some resistance. And so when you hit a tank with a pulse, the tank will resonate at first, you know, real well at first, and then slowly die out as the resistance dissipates the energy that's in the system. And so, uh, to keep the tank going, you constantly have to be hitting it with pulses. And that's what this setup effectively does. What you have is an input to a NPN uh, bipolar junction transistor. And uh, the, you, uh, through the input, you feed your effectively set of pulses. You can do an AC waveform. You can do square, uh, square wave you know, all kinds of things, but you want the pulse to be nice and sharp. And then this will uh, pull the system low and then release it, pull it low and release it. And uh, this is all because, first of all, notice how there's no uh, biasing on this 
transistor all you have is a resistor to ground and what that actually serves to do is to make that pulse a little sharper that uh, instead of uh, this junction coming on at uh, the you know roughly uh, 0 0.6 0 0.7 volts turning on the transistor uh, the resistor actually makes that voltage higher because you have to overcome the drop of the resistor and uh, the junction of the diode together and so uh, you know the pulse here uh, becomes sharper because of that and so uh, if you have something like this on the input like that uh, really let me kind of the stuff down here doesn't particularly do anything it's just you know if, if this is the zero line like that it's just the stuff up here that does something and then on the output you get something that's at least roughly sinusoidal and so now the question is well if a class c amplifier is not used for audio what is it used for uh, commonly this is used for uh, rf type applications that uh, this kind of circuit is great at amplifying high frequency uh, signals that uh, you can feed like a, a crystal or oscillator into here and then get an amplified version of it coming out here. Uh, the other thing to mention is uh, with a class C, you can break up a class C into basically two categories, which is tuned and not tuned. Uh, the real difference is what's coming into the input because as I mentioned there is a uh, there is a resonant frequency that this tank will operate at and if you drive the input with that same fr resonant frequency then you have a tuned class C and you get the most output out here uh, if you uh, start driving a class C with a frequency that's not the same frequency as the resonant frequency of the tank uh, the output amplitude starts to diminish where the tank will you know try to uh, uh, resonate at the lower at the frequency of excitation but it's not really that great at it and uh, you can get harmonics and other things so uh, for a class C tuned is obviously better as far as efficiency uh, again we don't particularly care because this isn't used for audio now this is a class D amplifier. A couple of things to get out of the way right away. Even though a class D amplifier uh, resembles a digital amplifier, there's no such thing as a digital amplifier. Specifically in the sense of for amplifying audio. Uh, there are some instances of like a communication type amplifier which technically does amplify uh, digital signals but uh, if it's going to go in your ear hole. No such thing as a digital amplifier. Uh, the reason it's called a class D is that that was the next letter after C. That's really the only thing that, you know, that's the reason why the, the letter D was used. D does not stand for digital. The thing about a class D amplifier is most likely you will purchase this uh, compl um, uh, complete or almost complete. The reason being is that the design of the class D amplifier is substantially more complicated than even the AB amplifier. That you probably wouldn't use discrete elements to uh, put one of these together yourself. You would purchase one as a whole. But it's still important to understand how they work on the inside. The input of a class D amplifier is sampled uh, by a comparator. And again, even though I'm saying sampled, it's still not digital. It's not a uh, pulse code modulation, it's a uh, pulse width modulation. And the pulse width modulation doesn't contain any digital data. It still contains analog data. And so the way this is done is with a comparator, uh, you compare two signals. And when uh, one signal is higher than the other signal, the comparator goes high. And when the signal is lower than the other signal, the comparator goes low. 
And those are the only two outputs of a comparator is high or low. Which one, you know, it's comparing the two signals. Which one's higher, which one's lower. So you'll get a high and a low. The trick to this whole thing is, is that right, the audio goes into one channel of the comparator, but the other channel of the comparator gets a triangle wave. Uh, a, or actually I guess a sawtooth might be a, a better uh, word for it. Um, the thing about, uh, the thing that kind of makes the whole thing work is that this waveform, the triangle wave, um, is at a much, much higher frequency than the audio, usually at least four to 10 times higher. And the reason for that will come become apparent when we get to down here, but effectively this is the, the, the quote unquote special sauce of the class D. This is what kind of brings the whole thing together. So well, you get an audio input and you get a uh, triangle wave down here. The output of that is fed into a MOSFET drive. And uh, the MOSFET drive is set up rather like the class B amplifier. And uh, what I forgot to mention earlier, another term for a class B amplifier would be a push-pull totem. So that's exactly how this is set up, is a push-pull totem. The thing about uh, the MOSFETs, both the MOSFETs and how uh, they're being driven, is just one MOSFET is on at a time. So uh, this symbol right here is a not, and so when this one is on, this one is not on. And when this one is uh, not on, this one is not not on. And so it makes it actually on because the you know, two negatives make a positive. Obviously, the, the, it works in, in language and it also works in uh, uh, electrical stuff, but not in real life. <laughs> but anyway, uh, just one MOSFET is on at a time. But the catch here is that uh, whereas with, let's say, class B amplifier, you can have moments where uh, the uh, transistor uh, is not completely on. And actually, most of the transistor's life is spent not on. With the class D amplifier, these MOSFETs are either completely on or completely off. The reason why that's so much more efficient is that uh, with a MOSFET, when you turn it on completely, the uh, on resistance of a MOSFET tends to be very low. The really, really good high quality MOSFETs or power MOSFETs can get down into the milliohms for resistance. And so you can drive very high wattage outputs uh, with, uh, out generating much heat. There, you know, there's not a whole lot of loss here. Uh, and the waveform that kind of comes out of these right here looks something like it, it's a modulated square wave, which you can't really listen to uh, with your ear. But this is where uh, the, the special sauce of the high frequency uh, a triangle wave comes in is that once you take the signal and pass it through a low pass filter what comes out uh, of the amplifier becomes uh, almost identical to uh, the audio that was uh, sampled and put in the first place. So the biggest advantage of a class D amplifier then becomes its efficiency because these MOSFETs are on and off, uh, either completely on or completely off, uh, you dissipate very little heat. And so the amplifier can be um, uh, more than 90% efficient, particularly at you know, very high uh, powers. And because of that you know, very high efficiency, uh, you dissipate very little heat. And so what you get is an amplifier that can go into a very small package. And also because of the efficiency, uh, these amplifiers tend to be very popular in uh, mobile electronics. You know, cell phones, MP3 players, and whatnot. Uh, because oftentimes, they can actually fit the entire package of this amplifier into a chip. Where 
both the comparator, the drive, the MOSFETs, and the low-pass filter can be etched directly on silicon. And the, the, these amplifiers can be minuscule with just the time, you know, the smallest amount of heat sinking, you can drive uh, quite a bit of high power through it. If you didn't already catch this, uh, the disadvantage of a Class D amplifier is uh, the output here is actually uh, has some fair amount of distortion to it. The reason being is that you, you know, matching the slow pass element perfectly to uh, what the drive stage here is outputting uh, isn't uh, an exact science, so to speak. Uh, also, uh, with the low pass filter, uh, you, there's a trade off between uh, how steep of a filter it is, you know, what the roll off is, uh, and, you know, uh, the complexity of it because, you know, the steeper the roll off, the more complex it is. But, eh, and so uh, some small amount of the high frequency component can leak out into the audio, but generally uh, what they try to do is to make the high frequency component above uh, where you can actually uh, hear the audio. And so even if a little bit of that component leaks through, uh, you won't necessarily be able to hear it. Um, yeah, that's that really uh, uh, summarizes the uh, Class D. And so now we've discussed uh, uh, the first what, four or five amplifier classes. Uh, there are many more, but most of the other amplifier classes are just uh, variations on the first ones here that we looked at. So the class A, very, uh, uh, very good signal fidelity. The output is, is nice and clean uh, when compared to the input. Uh, but uh, very low uh, efficiency. Uh, the class B, much better efficiency, but uh, you get distortion in the crossover you know, where the signal passes zero. Uh, the class AB tries to fix that to give you, uh, you know, the best of both worlds, but you suffer in efficiency, whereas uh, the class B is a higher efficiency than the class AB. Uh, the class C, Almost not even worth mentioning, completely worthless for audio, used for other things. And then the class D, not a digital amplifier. So you cannot listen to uh, zero or one. You always have to listen to uh, the audio portion. And even though the thing samples, again, the output is a uh, pure analog. It's, you know, so your ear can listen to it. As I mentioned at the beginning, this was a very, very advanced topic. And if you uh, didn't quite understand everything, don't worry about it. So you can always do research on Google to fill in some of the pieces that I didn't talk about. Uh, and you can, uh, you're always welcome to put comments down below uh, with any questions or comments that you might have. Uh, thank you for watching.